It can be a fool's errand to try to characterize the writing of an author whose work has been awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature, but in the case of novelist Kazuo Ishiguro, one might easily say, still waters run deep. Whether in his earlier work, such as The Remains of the Day, or more recently, The Buried Giant, among his many gifts to readers is finding the quiet, profound markings of life and capturing them in story. Kazuro Ishiguro is author of eight books, including his new novel, Clara and the Sun. And he joins us now from London, UK. It is so good to see you and have you back on this program. I guess we should say that since you were last here several years ago, I don't know, what's changed in your life? Oh yeah, you won the Nobel Prize, which is not bad at all. And in fact, we're gonna bring a picture up here just to um, set up the first question, which is, so has your life changed much since you won the Nobel Prize? Yeah, that, that picture um, is taken in my back garden. <laughs> and um, about about literally about an hour before that scene, I had no idea I'd won the Nobel Prize. You know, I, I don't know if you can see it in the photograph. I haven't washed my hair. You know, I was just sitting at the table, kitchen table, having a late breakfast, and then uh, I got a couple of phone calls, and then all these guys were at my door. Um, you know, far more. I mean, you can't even see how many uh, you know news people turned up. A uh, complete shock. Um, no, it was, a, um, it was a fantastic experience. It's a great honor. Uh, but I have to tell you, I mean, it, it feels to me now like it, it, it's something that happened to somebody else, you know. Um, uh, um, and my writing life hasn't changed. My personal life hasn't much changed, you know. Um, uh, it, it's like uh, it happened in a parallel universe. Um, and I have this, this avatar that, you know, went around receiving these things and giving acceptance speeches and then uh, uh then there's me here my <laughs> study is just as untidy as ever and uh, all my problems as a as a writer that uh, yeah, all the all the difficulties that were sitting there on my desk uh were there in a kind of Marie Celeste kind of way it's still there uh and that's kind of how it's been so in a way everything changes but in another way nothing changes is that right yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to belittle it. You know, I think it's a tremendous honor. And I kind of feel it's a, you know, I've accepted the honor on behalf of um, my generation of writers, you know, not just on behalf of British writers, but, you know, uh, may, you know, writers of my generation. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's great that that writing um, has been has, has been put up there alongside the sciences and economics, you know, and peace uh, as something worthy of a Nobel Prize. So um, I'm, I'm kind of pleased to win it on behalf of the, uh, the literary community. Wonderful. Let's talk about your new book, Clara and the Sun, which I, I tell you, I, I read in one sitting and is just, I mean, this is a lovely, lovely, wonderful story. And I, I guess one of the things that I found so intriguing about it was you really don't tell us what this story is about until about page 46, and I don't want to give away too much, obviously, as we have this conversation, but, but, but this notion of a person shopping for an AF, and we don't find out what the AF is until page 46. Uh, so I guess I'm, let's start here. Where did the idea of, of shopping for an artificial friend, where did this all come from? Well, that idea isn't that new. I mean, I, I, I think um, in some parts of the world, um, uh, there are artificial intelligence uh, companions, particularly for elderly people, already being marketed. Um, I, th I think there are some in Japan and, and, and also in the United States. So that's not my idea. But I was imagining a world in which, um, I, you know, I invented that term AF, you know. Um, the AFs are more or less ubiquitous. They're, they're, they don't um, cause uh, consternation if they're seen in the street. I mean, they're like bicycles or uh, refrigerators you know people have them in this world um and they're principally creatures sweet creatures you know um that are designed to keep prevent teenagers from becoming lonely um and so the the novel begins with clara in a store uh, she's just been kind of created i guess so she knows nothing she she's looking at the human world and learning learning about it at an exponential rate by looking out of the window and she's hoping that some nice teenager will come and buy her. So that, that's, that's how it starts. It's interesting that you say, I imagined a world or I created a world, because as I tried to figure out where this story is actually set, 
I'm not sure I figured it out. So do you want to tell us where and when this place is? Well, geographically, it's probably the United States because, you know, they have sidewalks rather than pavements and uh, and so on, you know. Um, so I, I put it down somewhere in the United States, but it's not it's not that important, you know, um, uh, in the literal sense where it's set. But I kind of felt it's appropriate to the United States. I wanted it to be in the United States because um, for, for a lot of the kind of images um, that I wanted to put in that book, I, I had a lot of those kind of, I had a lot of Americana images, you know, the paintings of Edward Hopper or Grant Wood uh, from, you know, these kind of paintings from the 1930s, both of kind of rural landscapes with big skies and open fields and a kind of a, and a, and a grain silo in the, on the horizon, that kind of thing. And also these cityscapes with, with the sun, you know, shafts of the sun coming down between tall buildings. Um, I had a lot of those images in my head. So, so you know, I, I kind of liked the idea that it was some kind of slightly futuristic America or maybe like an, an alternative version of America today. And also America is a very young society as I think we've been reminded you know, forcefully in the, in the last few months. And this is a society in great flux because um, advances in science and technology are bringing enormous changes to, to the way it's organized. And so um, in some ways I thought um, America is, a, is because of the, the, the youthfulness of its institutions um, was quite a good place to set it down. You do ask some fascinating questions about how well we can know what's in people's hearts, and, and actually not only people's hearts, but, but the hearts of artificial friends as well. And let's just pluck a little excerpt from the book here as I set up this next question. Then let me ask you something else you write. Let me ask you this. Do you believe in the human heart? I don't simply mean the organ, obviously. I'm speaking in the poetic sense. The human heart. Do you think there is such a thing? Something that makes each of us special and individual? And you, you, I guess, posit the notion that there is, even in artificial intelligence, the possibility of, of true heart being there. Can you help us understand what you were driving at here? Yeah, well, that, that, that quote um, comes from the mouth of one of the characters. And that's a question that's actually addressed to, to the narrator, Clara, who, this little artificial intelligence uh, girl, um, who by this point has learned a huge amount about the human world because she she picks things up and she's very fast um and she's now living outside of that shop she's living with a family and she's trying to save that family from heartbreak you know um and 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 i guess yeah at, at a certain point she's asked by one of the members of the family what, what she's being asked there really is um yeah, a, a super intelligent machine like you, a piece of artificial intelligence, can you actually learn a human being fully to the point where where you might actually be able to replace them if the if if the um you know the unthinkable thing happens and that person dies, um, you know, uh, have you got the ability to actually learn so much about a person that you're living side by side with? every day of your life that um, you'll be able to more or less, um, you know, replicate her in, in kind of a way a digital copy is not really a digital copy at all. It's, it's, it's exactly the same as the thing it's copied from, you know. Um, uh, so that that's kind of what's behind that question in that scene. Um, and the, the questioner is basically asking, isn't there something about human beings that makes each individual so unique and special that even an incredibly observant machine like you, you will never be able to penetrate that core of a human individual. And that will remain unique. And if we lose it, we have the right to mourn its passing and we will feel its loss and it will never be replaced. That, that, that's, I guess that, that's what's behind that conversation. It's taken from a key kind of piece of dialogue um, quite late in the, uh, in the novel. Now, I guess we as humans, some, some of us very narcissistic humans, that's not a reference to your former president, incidentally, just so, so we're clear. Uh, not, your, not, my president. not your president, exactly, <laughs> but the president in, in, um, in the story. Uh, we'd like to think that there is something so utterly unique about us that there's only one of us in the entire universe and couldn't possibly be replicated. 
you are, you are positing with us the notion that we maybe ought not to be that cocky about our uniqueness. This is, were you as uncomfortable writing this as I was reading it? Yes, yes. I mean, uh, um, and I, I suppose, you know, I try to address that. Well, at least Clara tries to address it, you know, in, in the final passages of the, of the book. But um, it, it is a notion that I feel is creeping up on us. Uh, I think for, for centuries and centuries, you know, we human beings, we've even long after we've, many of us have stopped believing in God in the old fashioned way or a relationship between our soul and God in the classic kind of religious sense. Long after we've kind of stopped believing that in any literal way, I, um, we have held on to this idea that there is some kind of a soul or something unique, some invisible ghost, you know, that, that occupies our bodies. Um, and and it's because of that that it makes sense when I say something like, uh, you know, I love my wife or I love my daughter. Uh, there's something actually unique about my wife and my daughter that that makes love in that human context um, something meaningful. Now, because we live in a world where big data, algorithms, um, and, and artificial intelligence is becoming more and more every day, and every time we go shopping online or um, we, we try and uh, download a movie or something, um, we get people predicting what, what we'd want to see next week uh, and what we might want to shop for next week. I mean, possibly I'm saying that we might be getting to a point where we start to actually question a lot of these assumptions on which we've organized family life. And I have to say in, in the larger sense, um, our societies around the notion that the individual is a sacrosanct unit uh, upon which we have to build all our political systems. Um, we might start to be tempted to think, actually, we're not that complex or unique. We're, we're, you know, we're a bunch of algorithms. Um, and this is some sort of superstition from the past that we're hanging on to. So, th so that's the idea that, that, that that's being um, interrogated, I guess, by the characters in this book, not in an intellectual way, but in an emotional way, because we have a situation in this family where, where the daughter is pretty sick and, um, I guess the mother is trying to uh, to preempt, you know, utter an utter sense of loss and bereavement, and and is wondering if this is some way out of it. Hmm. You know, one of the really fascinating choices you made in writing this book, and obviously, I mean, you're a man in your sixties, so I'm not saying that every book you write has to be narrated by a man in his sixties, but you are narrating this book as an artificial intelligence young girl and i wonder how tricky that is for you since that's not who you are but i've never i've never narrated from uh, people who are like me when i was when i was a young writer uh, you know, my first novel i wrote in my 20s uh, the novel that was mentioned in the introduction the remains of the day i wrote in my uh, in my early 30s uh, the narrators were always elderly people looking back on their lives you know um, i've always found it easier uh, to write from the perspective of characters who are not like me. And I, I've always been drawn to writing from the point of view of um, outsiders, you know, people who are slightly outside uh, the society, or in this case, outside of the human race, uh, because uh, um, it's, it provides these kind of tremendous focusing opportunities. If you've got somebody strange like Clara, she's almost like an alien, it's very natural for her to ask these questions, which uh, other contexts might seem rather over philosophical or even pretentious. You know, it's very natural for this naive, sweet machine type girl to to ask questions like, uh, you know, why do human beings have loneliness? You know, are they fundamentally lonely? I mean, she she asks this question because she, she's created to prevent teenagers from becoming lonely. So she, she, she tends to see everything through the lens of loneliness, even when she's looking out at the street um, and trying to learn about the human world beyond her shop, she's looking at it in terms of loneliness. Now, are they behaving like that to avoid loneliness? And of course, later she starts to, when she learns more, it's natural for her to ask these questions, like you know, what do human beings mean when they say the word love? Hmm. Um, 
and and yeah and that big question you know, so, so what what makes a human being unique is there something special about each individual human being or not i think these questions come much more naturally um and you can avoid that kind of um the seminar room kind of discussion uh, you know it can just take place in a context of a of a story like a very human family story uh, when you have a narrator like that um but also i mean you, okay i'm a 66 year old guy you know but and clara seems to be this kind of machine girl but that's another thing that's another kind of opportunity you have if you have an ai narrator i i thought i could i could combine just in this one character many many parts of the many stages of the kind of typical human lifespan uh, and 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 often at the one and the same time some aspects of her remain like a small child and she has kind of small child's logic the kind of naivety and kind of drawing weird conclusions from the very limited evidence she has while at the same time she's become very super sophisticated about learning about other aspects of hu human beings and, and so i think she goes through being like a baby to being like a teenager to being like a mother i think a lot of the time she, you know she has a strong parental urge and towards the end of the book she's like um, she's like an elderly person who's been discarded by the very people she's cared for and no longer has a function and her role is uh, the only thing that remains to her is to look back and ask herself did she do her work well um so to me i mean her she's not age specific you know she 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 gives me that freedom and uh, as you say as somebody of my age i can i can kind of look back to different stages of my life as well as looking at other people who who i know or people who've been dear to me and uh, i can put all these things into this character hmm. now i do need to ask you about the housekeeper and it may well be that i referenced donald trump in an earlier question and he may very well be in my brain because the housekeeper in your book who's clearly an immigrant by the way you have her speaking english clearly her second language and her name is melania now would you be trying to draw attention to anybody in particular by naming this immigrant melania no, that's just coincidence. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> it honestly is. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, uh, when I was writing that book, I actually thought, uh, it did occur to me, but I thought by the time this book comes out, um, uh, both the president, the, the, the then current president and his wife will, will no longer be so much in the public eye. I, I I made that prediction, and I and uh, and I was correct. <laughs> uh, it's a it's a it's a very common uh, name from from Europe, uh, particularly Eastern Europe. So, um, and it doesn't pin her down to any one uh, country or ethnicity. So, I I I, th I thought I mean she's a slightly comic character. So I I thought it, it's a it's a safe it's a relatively safe name. You know, I'm not I'm not going to get trolled by people from you know from one particular <laughs> nation somewhere, uh, if I use that name. Although your Melania sure loves the F-bomb. Um, well, I guess so, yeah. But, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, okay. Um, the last time you were on this program, uh, you talked to another one of our hosts, Pia Chattopadhyay, who interviewed you then, and you were talking about writing and storytelling, and there was a nugget in that conversation that I thought particularly fascinating that I wanted to follow up on. And let's just play a short snippet from that interview and then we'll come back and chat. Sheldon, if you would, the clip. If we want to keep up a serious storytelling tradition, I think it's very important as a culture that we do, in you know, whatever form, whatever medium that we choose. I mean, the stories have to be genuine. They're not just audience manipulation mm -hmm. vehicles. You know, they have to actually reveal proper truths in some kind of way for people to really value them mm. for some, as something more than just entertainment that passes the time. First of all, you've barely aged a day, so congratulations on that. That's, that's uh, six years ago. But second of all, that expression, proper truth, and how your work is obliged to reveal some kind of proper truth, I found most interesting. What proper truth do you think Clara and the Sun reveals? Well, what I mean by proper truth there, I mean, it, it's not something that can kind of be fact-checked. I, I guess, I mean, and it's not for me to say, it's not for me to say whether Clara and the Sun contains an authentic truth. I'm talking about some kind of emotional truth. You know, I'm, 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 I'm presenting, in the book, 
overall, I'm presenting a, a certain vision, a set of feelings about human experience that, that are mine, and I'm putting them out there, and I'm, and I'm asking readers, do you feel this too? You know, or is it just me? You know, am, I, am I weird? Or do you understand what I'm getting at here at that emotional level? Does this chime in with, with what you think about human life? And when I'm saying, when I'm talking, you know, six years ago, and I must say I, I look very solemn, and maybe I used to be very solemn in those days. <laughs> but I, mean, but um, I think what I was getting at then was, was that um, you got, we have to be able to recognize the difference between sentimentality and emotional manipulation as it exists in stories, you know, whether it's fiction or movies. Which means that you know we, we should always take a step back, even if it's something is actually really involving us, making us cry, making us laugh. We should take a step back and ask, well, all right, is this just something that all right, the journey is quite interesting and fun, but it's it doesn't have a great deal to do with um, real life, or do, or do we say that actually it actually it's not just that it moves us at that superficial level, it actually is a reflection of what I feel about life and how life is. Now, I think this is very important now. I think, I think we've, in those intervening years, I think we've seen what you, know, what you might roughly call this, this era of post-truth uh, become, become very large. And, um, and it seems to, you know, right now we're, we're in the country neighboring yours, and we, if I'm reading this correctly, about half of the people who live in it think that Donald Trump actually won the election, uh, and it doesn't really matter that there is no evidence, because what matters is what you feel. And if you feel that Donald Trump won the election, then you're allowed to hold that belief as the truth. Now, what's very interesting in the era of the pandemic, it seems to me, is that we have that kind of notion that's been growing stronger and stronger, the disregard for evidence has run straight into an emergency situation where we rely absolutely and desperately on the scientific method, something that relies absolutely on rigor and evidence. And I know that in the world of science, you know, my father was a scientist and you know, I'm, I've been privileged to meet a lot of leading scientists. You know, they have a kind of a rigor that, that perhaps doesn't exist in the world of writing. You know, um, they challenge each other with evidence and when, when the argument seems to be won, uh, you just you just concede. You say, yes, you're right. I was wrong. Uh, let's move on. You know, now we can actually take the next step towards the truth. There's an assumption that there is a truth to be discovered. We're, and and it's interesting that we have we've we've had this collision of these two ways of looking at the world. Uh, and they, they seem to have reached an extreme in this past year. And I do. There is a part of me that is concerned that because I you know because my job what I do is is I write these books that essentially do things to people emotionally um, I, I have actually asked this question have I been contributing to this era of post-truth this idea that all that matters is what you feel you know it, 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 basically the truth equals what you want to believe and as long as you kind of feel it deeply enough you have the right to continue to believe it. I mean, am I contributing to that uh, by by producing novels that I claim, you know, contain some sort of emotional truth that is beyond verification by science or or fact checking? Uh, and so, I don't know. It's very interesting when you played that clip to me. I mean, back then, I mean, these things weren't really in my mind. But uh, hmm. but I would say the same thing again. I think it's more important than ever. That, well, in, indeed, you know, people such as yourself, yourself, Steve, and readers and critics, that they learn to exercise a sharp critical judgment uh, and ask themselves, you know, when they're being entertained, when they're being moved, when they're being made to cry or laugh, you know, what's behind it? Is this something, is there some actual hard truth? Does this bear, bear up to scrutiny? when you put it alongside what you really feel to be your own 
experience and vision of the world. I, th I think we do need scrutiny now in the arts world, just as we do in the world of science. You can't just go along just making things up and claiming, you know, it's true. Well, I don't know if I get a vote on this, but I would, I would vote no. You are not contributing to a kind of a post-truth world where only feelings matter and empirically provable facts don't matter. I would say no, you're not contributing to that. In fact, quite the contrary. You are giving us some utterly profound things to think about in a beautiful way, which we're, we perhaps have not thought about before. And I know one of the questions that came to my mind after I read the book was, you know, the, the, the artificial friends in your book are not always very well treated by their human minders. And I wondered whether you foresaw a future where not only are people going to need a Bill of Rights or a Charter of Rights, as we have here in Canada, but whether artificial intelligence friends are also going to need some kind of Charter of Rights because, because their rights are not respected in a way that ours are currently. Can I get you to weigh in on that? It, uh, to be frank, Steve, I mean, it's, that's not one of the things that concerns me about artificial intelligence. You know? uh, um, but yes, I'm, I've often heard people say that, you know, that, that, I mean, once we get to a point where we think that machines are, are sensitive, have emotions, then we do have to extend some rights. I think there are some very big challenges about artificial intelligence and gene editing that are upon us right now. You know, uh, because I think um, these fields, th there's been huge advances in both of these fields. Um, and we haven't really woken up to them as a society. That, that, that's my feeling, you know. Um, and I, I don't, you know, for a start, I, I don't, I'm not one of those people who worries that, you know, robots will take over the world and we'll all become chained slaves, you know. I, I, I'm not worried about that. And to be honest, m m maybe I should be, but I, I'm not that concerned about, you know, the, uh, about um, uh, Android rights either, you know. Um, I'm more concerned about, I think the more urgent questions about AI would, would be to do with the fact that perhaps the majority of people will soon be out of work. And that system that we used to have for centuries that assumed that most people will be able to work and earn a living, and that's how they'll get on with their private lives. I and mean, that system might have to be rethought entirely. You know? um, and also I would worry, the second my area of worry about artificial intelligence is that it's a way of you know, baking in, hardwiring our prejudices and our biases of our current age. Um, and, uh, and we won't be able to get it out of the black box because we, we don't quite know, you know how the conclusions are being reached, how the recommendations and advice that comes out of artificial intelligence is being produced. And we won't be able to unpack them in the way that we've been able to unpack decisions of the past, like you know, slavery or you know, sexism or racism. Um, you know, we've moved on and we've been able to say, no, we, we've got to redo that. But I'm not, I, I think it's going to be more difficult to do with artificial intelligence uh, recommending big, uh, big things to us. And the third, my, my third area of worry is that artificial intelligence will actually take away the advantage, the leading edge that, that liberal democracies had over authoritarian, centrally planned uh, societies in the past, uh, which enabled, I would say, you know, the open societies to, to win that Cold War battle. Um, uh, I think possibly we will lose the uh, advantage um, that the capitalist open market system had. Um, um, and so, so th these will be the areas that I worry about, um, rather than, um, uh, you know, are, 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 we, are we being rather insensitive to our artificial friends? You know? uh, yeah, I think we should be nice to, nice to them, but I, I think we'll, get, we'll do that anyway, because human beings are always very sentimental. Well, all of those concerns that you put on the record notwithstanding, you have, you have made the hero of your book a rather selfless artificial intelligence friend. Again, I'm not going to give away the plot here, but, but your AF is a hero. So uh, you may be concerned about all of those things, but that's, to me, that's not the big story you just told. No, no, I, I just raised that because, I mean, you, you raised the possible issues that might face us, but, um, but I, I'm also excited by AI. You know, and, and indeed with gene editing, I think they will bring us enormous benefits, particularly in medical science, 
um, uh, I, but in many other respects as well, you know, in, in feeding the world. Um, I'm just hope, but it's like any tool. It's up to us to actually figure out how we use it. You know, um, do we use it to to try and reduce the inequalities that are, that have been developing at an incredible rate uh, in over the last decades, or do we do we allow it to increase the inequality levels within societies and between countries? You know. Um, uh, but Clara, for me, is an optimistic figure. Um, she's full of hope, and, and she never lets go of hope because of her relationship with the son. I mean, this is something we haven't talked about. The, <laughs> the story is called uh, Clara and the Son, and um, she she has an almost like religious-like uh, belief in the son uh, because she's solar-powered, I suppose, as the source of kindness and goodness and um, and, and the and there's some as a kind of a being that she can appeal to um to come to the rescue uh and she never loses her faith in in the sun and that that you know that she's able to remain hopeful and and of course i think clara is also a kind of a a mirror reflection of 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 human beings when I mean, she goes out there she absorbs all this information about human behavior she takes it on and so she's a kind of a all right she's a distorted refracted funny reflection a kind of strange little mirror of human behavior but she is made up of human behavior and i think i i'm trying in this book as a kind of a reply to an earlier book of mine never let me go which i i think looking back now over the years seems to me a, a very sad book a very bleak book i i think i wanted to reply to my own book with something more hopeful and optimistic and uh, uh, so Clara is a figure of optimism, and um, and she kind of wins through, you know. Mission accomplished. You know, I could talk to you all day, but I got a feeling you got other more pressing things to get to. So I'm going to thank you very much for being on TVO with us tonight to talk about Clara and the Sun, Kazuo Ishiguro. It's been a great pleasure getting to meet and talk to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been fantastic to talk to you, Steve. Thank you very much. <laughs>